All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Francisco Chavez from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, where he is a senior scientist who leads the biological oceanography group there. Uh, Francisco earned a BS in oceanography from Cal Poly Humboldt, uh, formerly Humboldt State University, and subsequently a PhD in botany from Duke University where he became one of the first scientists to describe the biological effects of El Nino with his graduate advisor, uh, Dr. Richard Barber, in 1983. Since then, Francisco has continued to make contributions to the field of biological oceanography through studies focusing on marine primary productivity as it relates to interannual and decadal variability, particularly in the California and Humboldt current upwelling systems. He is also on the Governing Council of the Central and Northern California Ocean Observing System, a wide array of sensors used to monitor conditions within the California current. Francisco's current work focuses on the biology and chemistry of the ocean in relation to global change, as well as instrumentation and systems for long-term ocean observing, including in situ measurements of eDNA. Uh, and his talk today is titled The Future of Eastern Boundary Upwelling Systems from Observations to Management. And with that, I'd like to go away to Dr. Francisco Chavez. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, I see we, we have a similar problem at, uh, at Imbari where when we have Zoom meetings, uh, uh, you know, many people sit in their offices and, and watch them. I must admit that I have done that as well. Anyway, thank, thank you for, uh, for inviting me up here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to Bodega. This talk is a uh, somewhat of a repeat of a talk that I gave last year at a uh, uh, international meeting in Lima. It was uh, uh, basically titled the same as this, this one is. Uh, I work with a very talented artist who uh, put this image together. We worked together on it uh, uh, just to showcase uh, uh, many of the threats that uh, our ocean uh, uh, feels, uh, as well as some of the physical uh, chemical impacts of the upwelling process here and the a different array of instruments that we use. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of a wild ride uh, here. Hopefully I can get done in a lot of time. This is from another special issue or a special issue that was published uh, some time ago. And this is from the cover of that special issue. And I wanted to use it to sort of get us all on the same page in relation to this is in the southern hemisphere, the other one is in the northern hemisphere. So the upwelling winds here are from the south, driving the upwelling process, which brings water from below the thermocline to the surface, fertilizes uh, our ocean, uh, mostly uh, diatoms from the base of the food chain. Uh, the euphausids are an important component, and uh, uh, Small forage fish are very abundant. In fact, Peru is the biggest producer of uh, uh, forage fish catch in the, in the world. They it, it, it also contain some interesting uh, 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 processes. They, they have, have ox strong oxygen minimum zones. And also depicted here is the increasing wind field as we go offshore, driving the curl of the wind stress which is another process that uh, uh, brings uh, waters upwards. If you go further offshore, you get into the typical open ocean or the trophic environments. I, I was born in a little uh, town in northern Peru called Talara. And uh, for my PhD dissertation, I came back and, and established a time series site here in Paita. Uh, my PhD advisor, uh, Richard Barber thought that if the physicists could could uh, uh, follow propagating disturbances as they could with sea level all along the coast, uh, that that uh, biologists should be able to do the same thing. So we, we were thinking we were going to study the the propagating disturbances. Uh, the the uh, uh, time series started in June of 1982, and on September 22nd uh, of that year. The temperature at the site where I was working at, uh, up five degrees centigrade, and it kept going up. And at the height of of uh, the anomalies, uh, the uh, temperature 
a difference between the average, which is this dotted line, and the observed temperature was in the order of 10 degrees centigrade. There was a, a huge uh, uh, climatic disturbance that changed the entire ecosystem and my PhD thesis at the same time. Uh, and, but we did, we did uh, do some of the things that uh, we thought we were gonna do. I plotted both sea level, which is what, we, what was measured here. We, we put this site here because there was a sea level gauge. And then I inverted the sea level here and I plotted against the, the concentration of nitrate at 60 meters which is the uh, water, the depth from the where water is up well. So in a normal uh, conditions, there's 25 or so micromoles of nitrate at that depth, and that's brought up to the surface, which causes this fertilizing effect. It, at the height of El Nino, uh, that concentration was pretty much zero. So even though we continue to upwell water, this was a uh, image that was actually published in National Geographic that famous scientific journal uh, where uh, we, we were making the comparison of the normal conditions where waters from below the uh, 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 neutrocline are brought to the surface, fertilize it, and you have a happy fisherman, and the El Nino conditions where the, the thermocline is depressed, and no matter if the winds continue to blow up or unfavorable, the fertilizing effect is, is no longer there. And then there was huge changes in the uh, 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 megafauna in the regions, and I won't put, put to, uh, get into that at this point in time. So what are, what are some of the characteristics of these eastern boundary upwelling systems, which, of course, California is one of them. I expect that you know that. Uh, uh, there's enhanced, I guess probably should stand, start with the enhanced ocean fertilization, but there's also enhanced ocean variability. They're very uh, clearly linked to uh, uh, processes that drive interannual to multidecadal variations. There's enhanced ocean acidity because the waters that come up are uh, more corrosive, and, and they're also lower in oxygen areas. They have short food chains and tend to be have lower biodiversity during the productive periods. They enhance forest species. Uh, humans, in particular, in, in, in Peru, are highly dependent on them for uh, subsistence. And as like almost any other one, but perhaps even more so, they're susceptible to anthropogenic pressures. And they're currently poorly represented in models. So the outline, and, and the, these were the themes that the meeting that we, we organized in Peru had. We started with ocean physics, then went into biology, socioecology, and, and, and what I'm uh, uh, going to try to do is go through all of these at a, at a sort of a high level with a focus on observations management in the future. Uh, as we know, we have somewhat mature ocean observing systems and data sets for ocean physics. We, we, we have, you know, when I was a graduate student, we didn't quite have that, uh, uh, the, having these global images of SST and, uh, at, at various different levels and, and sea level and winds. And we, we filled the uh, ocean with uh, floats and moorings and other things. So, so we have a fairly uh, robust observing system for physics, which will allow us to do uh, uh, some analysis historically of the variability in ocean physics on a global scale, which I did with my colleague Monique Messier, uh, uh, some time ago now. And these pictures are the uh, first, first principal component, second, third, four of SST. And the top of each one of them and the bottom here are the time series of each of those uh, modes. And we've also plotted the index that we thought most resembled each one of them. And in the case of the first one, which is El Nino, the multi-decadal ENSO index looks almost exactly like that mode. Second mode is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which is probably the lo lowest frequency mode that comes out of this analysis. Third one is the Pacific decadal oscillation. We'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that. And the fourth one, which is probably the most interesting one 
for California today is the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation. And it, it, it was not discovered until somewhere around here because its amplitude was relatively small, but its amplitude has, has increased and probably has continued to increase. And much of the variability that we see in climate here in California today is driven by uh, this phenomena mixed in with all the rest of them together. Uh, so this is this is the uh, uh, getting back to the Pacific decadal oscillation. If we uh, uh, reduce the frequency of, in, in our analysis and look only at frequencies that are greater than eight years or more, then this is what comes out as the first mode. And, and this is the traditional description of the Pacific decadal oscillation. And each one of these, uh, there was a very big El Nino in 1925, which uh, caused a big shift in things. And the demise of the sardine was right around here. Uh, the demise of the anchovy was around here. So we, all these shifts from the positive to the negative phases were associated with big shifts in ecology in each one of these re in many of these regions. And, and at, the, at the meeting, I asked if it was ready to turn warm. Uh, we were going to see a change in species, and we'll, I'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, on the top is the uh, long-term trend in global SST, which is currently about 0.8 to 1 degree centigrade. If we go back at it. Uh, and the bottom panel is the anomaly in SST uh, in the past month. And if, if not, I'm not sure how many of you look at figures like this, but this is a, a somewhat of an unusual image because most of the time there's about equal amounts of blue, which are colder than average, and red. But that's not the case anymore. I'm not uh, exactly sure if it's because the trend is increasing and so we're looking at, at uh, uh, differences in the mean or if we've really entered a different stage in, in our world today. And on the right here, I have a figure that we just prepared for a paper in PNAS where I plotted the uh, uh, in black, this black line is CO2 from ice cores in the Southern Ocean. In red is the Mauna Loa CO2 record. In blue is the trend of uh, uh, CO2 as measured in Monterey Bay. And I'll, I'll show you that, the data that went into that in a little bit. And it's, it's, it's going a little bit faster than the, uh, uh, than the rate at, at in the atmosphere, but not significantly different. And then sea level at San Francisco and temperature all along the California coast from satellite and other uh, uh, composite data sets, of course, all increasing uh, over time, um, making us worry a little bit about what's gonna happen in the future. If we look at the four Eastern boundary currents uh, in terms of uh, uh, temperature trends, then we see that their their temperature trends are probably or probably not significantly different than the global trends. Uh, Peru maybe shows a little bit higher. It's the in the the coloring is the trend the spatial trend in each one of them. So California, most of the strongest warming is actually in, in from Mexico and up further north. I think this. Cooling may be associated with the MPGO that was negative at the, at the time. I talked a little bit about models, not much. Uh, uh, they're important for several reasons because if we can reproduce their observed patterns with our equations, they give us a degree of confidence that we understand the processes, which is always comforting. Uh, we can fill in our low resolution observations back in time to get high resolution hindcasts and. A lot of people are now using those for studies in there. And we can forecast the future and predict consequences, perhaps. 
However, since the models depend on equations developing from present day uh, observations, they won't include some phenomena like the phenomena that I showed earlier, where we, we have this unusual warming or we have these NBGO models. And so, in, a, in other words, the predictions will necessarily be imperfect. And a lot of people take models as truth, and we have to remember future. And, and here's the, somewhat of a theme uh, uh, for the, uh, where we're going. Model fidelity and accuracy is, a, is directly related to the quantity and quality of the uh, available observations. Hence, they're better for physics than biogeochemistry and weaker for biology. So we have, we have uh, good observation systems for physics and, and biogeochemistry is improving, but Uh, here's some projections uh, for the four eastern boundary currents from Bogrite et al. 2022. And, and you know, they, they, these are two different models. Uh, they're in temperature, they're consistent. One's going up faster than the others. In some of the other properties, it's not as clear, in particular for uh, biology, and I'll touch on this a little bit more. Uh, and oxygen is also, some of them are going to go down and some of them are going to be steady. So uh, mixed layer uh, uh, looks like it may deepen and temperature is definitely going up, but we don't have a very good idea of what might be happening with some of the other. And as I said in, in one of the earlier slides, these are poorly represented in, in models. So again, we have to uh, 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 worry about what our models are telling us for these regions at some times. So the, 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 uh, uh, we looked at the open ocean to some extent, uh, and now I'll just touch briefly on, on some of the observing systems that we have uh, for coastal areas. And I, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the glider lines that are, are being run uh, by mostly the Scripps Group, Line 90, uh, Line 80, I think, uh, in 67, where we are, and I'm not sure which line this one is, uh, John, but uh, it's run off of here. I can't remember it anymore, but this is, uh, John is, is helping run those. And so we now have, and we, we're able to get good uh, mean lines and anomalies of these uh, properties from, from many. Uh, this is some data from our neck of the woods, uh, the Monterey time series, which now has been running uh, almost 30, 35 years. What will happen to it when I retire, but, uh, and, and th this is what the annual cycle of temperature looks like, and this is what the mode of variability is. And in a, in a way, California is lucky because El Nino's tend to hit in the uh, winter time the least productive time. It's not the case in, in the Southern Hemisphere, off Peru, where the, where the productive region is summer. And uh, uh, it, there's a very strong correspondence, or there was uh, when, uh, when we did this, between the EOF mode one and the multi-decadal insulin index, except for these two years here. This, remember, this is the blob a year of 2014-15, the NPGO was just coming into the, and then the El Nino that was happened after it, which was not as strong as would, one would be predicted from the NEI. Uh, you can see the blob signatures in the uh, 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 lighter data as well, with this uh, strong anomaly in temperature, starting in 2014 and running through the year. As I said, the ocean observing systems for biogeochemistry are catching up. My colleague at Embari, Ken Johnson, has been instrumental in, in instrumenting many of the uh, uh, global cargo floats with biogeochemical sensors, nitrate, oxygen, pH. Now they're putting uh, uh, radiometers on there, uh, fluorometers, uh, backscatter sensors.
and and they're getting to the point where the maps that they generate globally uh, are uh, uh, just as good or better than these maps that took uh, 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 decades of ships off, ship, ship observations. So over the course of the last few years, they now have more uh, uh, measurements of biogeochemical properties in the open ocean than we did over the, over the 30 or 40 years of uh, shipboard measurements. A little more from the from our Monterey Bay time series. Uh, almost all of these values, except for the oxygen and jumbo squid, are uh, surface measurements. Temperature at the top, nitrate following, and you you, you see you what you expect the strong inverse relationship between temperature and nitrate. Uh, chlorophyll has been somewhat odd in that it's been productive throughout these sort of shifts in, in uh, because this was a warm decade, cool decades, and another warm decade. Uh, and in the face of all of that, chlorophyll has seemed to be a higher than average level. Oxygen has been declining, as you know, from several papers at depth, and I'll show you a little more about that. And that decline in oxygen seemed to bring in some of these uh, uh, organisms that are better adapted to low oxygen, like the jumbo squid. Uh, as PCO2 is increasing, pH is decreasing, and I'll show you some more details on that. This is what the, what the vertical uh, profile of the anomaly in uh, oxygen looks like in terms of the rate of decline and then the percent. So the, the biggest uh, decline in oxygen has been in the upper uh, 500 meters. In fact, it seems like there may be an increase. And uh, question I, I, I asked here was this because there's more flux coming in and there's more material and this deeper uh, area is one that's clearly caused by changes in ventilation. If people are familiar with the uh, uh, the water subsurface here, they cleansed uh, from waters from the from the eastern western Pacific coming down through Alaska. And if there's a change in the rate at which that uh, higher oxygen comes in, then oxygen will go down because you still have a decline. So most of the changes, most of the reasons. Many of the reasons why oxygen is low in the eastern boundary areas because they're poorly ventilated. On top of that, you add a lot of material that's sinking and degrading at depth. We found that uh, if we took, we, we had two cruises to the Gulf of California. And if we took the two cruises, they were separated by about a decade and, and took the difference from them, as opposed to looking at a high frequency time series, the, the shape of the uh, anomalies were very similar. We used that as a check that what we were measuring in Monterey Bay is germane to the rest of the California state. I think that's probably true almost anywhere you measure. Here, here are the uh, um, expanded uh, PCO2 and uh, CO2 measurements. Here is the uh, Mauna Loa record, and here is the very noisy uh, Monterey record. But if you take the uh, uh, regression of that, it it's not significantly different than uh, the Mauna Loa. Record. And I think that this, some of this greater increase might be because of the decrease in oxygen. Because if you consume if you consume oxygen, you produce CO two, and you respire. Okay, so and now we're we're starting to get into biology. Uh, remote sensing, in addition to giving us SST, sea level, and winds, also provides us with these beautiful images of ocean color chlorophyll. Um, but the question I asked was, how well can we detect trends? And in the paper we published in 2009, uh, th these were the trends that we found. Some of them were looked like they were increasing. 
and others looked like they were flat. And then we repeated that for this meeting. And basically the, the answer is that the, the answer is unclear. Not clear if productivity is changing in any of these places over time, at least as measured by chlorophyll. And what's even more worrying is if you use the different sensors, you get some different answers. The CCCI tried to put almost, a, 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 it was a composite of the different sensors, but it was, I don't know. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't get a warm and fuzzy feeling looking at the data. That, uh, uh, okay, so how, what about the global routine observing systems for biology? The picture I, I, uh, I do here is significantly weaker. And it's not because we're not trying. I mean, people go out on these, you know, we all do. We go out on these expeditions, you know, the, the, the trawls for fish, and they spend a very amount of time counting them, and et cetera, et cetera. We all know we, we all work pretty hard, but but we but we're hampered by the lack of technology. They can do the things that we can do for physics and biogeochemistry. Uh, the, the, there is a few, there are there are some I mean the the top program uh, now the ATN I think changed names a little bit where they tag animals it's probably the mo most developed observing uh, system for life in the sea but it's still pretty close I mean we get you get an idea of you know the uh, bluefin tuna going back and forth to Japan. These leatherback turtles making these incredible journeys to Monterey Bay to feed on jellyfish. Um, anyway, the, the, it's 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 what we have. For what I was you know, had to talk about, I already talked about this short food webs. Well, I guess because I was going to talk a little bit about the the variability in fish in these areas. Uh, yeah, this we wrote a paper in in science uh, uh, from anchovies to sardines and back was part of the title we see that the you know that there's strong relationships between uh, the physical environment and these fish so these fish somehow integrate uh, signals of the climate and they vary out of phase when the anchovies are abundant the sardines are not um, and the the uh, the model was that the in at least in the eastern Pacific, the eastern the anchovy was the cool phase, and in one phase, uh, sardine came in. But we did note in the paper that temperature was only a surrogate because in the western Pacific, off Japan. Uh, the cycle was exactly opposite. The anchovy was dominant in the warm periods in Japan. The was dominant in cold periods. So there was some relation to climate, but temperature was only telling us that there was a change in the climate, not what was driving the change in the ecosystem. So a traditional approach to biological or biodiversity monitoring, and I'm not being critical here, I'm just, just sort of trying to say where we are, was is to go to ship, go to sea on a ship a few times per year, collect samples, process the samples visually, and then it takes us a long time to synthesize that information, which is not at the right management scale. We're, we're, we're making, finding out things five years after we needed to make a decision to do something. So I think we have it in this world we live in, we have a new set of requirements like the, with the physical ocean, so we require continuous present. The information needs to be globally distributed. It needs to be multidisciplinary. We'd have to go uh, from very small organisms to very large ones. And we, whenever we can, we can, we can to, uh, uh, try to make it real time, which takes me to where I have been spending a lot of my time in the last which is working on environmental DNA. I think it's a technology 
is promising for many of the problems that we face today. For those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, um, just like if, if a, uh, a forensic science, if there was a crime in this room, hopefully not, <laughs> and the forensic scientist came in, it would sleep the floor and pick up residues and see if it, it could identify the suspect. Uh, in, in a way, this environmental DNA is very similar to that. Everything that's in the ocean releases material in some form or another, or can be, of course, and if it's very small, it, it'll be contained in a water sample. So we take this water sample and we uh, concentrate it in some form or another, then we extract the DNA, then we can analyze it using different uh, uh, barcode, meta barcodes, or that target either fish or mammals. I'm not showing mammals here, or mainly invertebrates, or mainly phytoplankton, or mainly microbes. And, and 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 then when we when we what we do is we have these barcodes that find the DNA of that organism, and then we replicate it, and then we send that. Uh, replicated material to next generation sequencing facility tells us something about organisms who are present. There's a fair bit of argument about if, how quantitative this is if it only tells us. And um, uh, I think that will be, as, we, as our techniques get better, we will get much more quantitative. Uh, there's the, you can also target a particular species directly if you wanted to. That's referred to as quantitative species. So our three markers that we use typically are this one, and part, because I'm not sure what to do with the information from the 16S small organisms. So these are the steps in uh, um, DNA processing, and what, what, where I'm going here is to, to show you how perhaps we can automate them. So you, you, you take uh, uh, this water and you, you collect it somehow, you concentrate it, you extract the DNA, you prepare the sample, and then you uh, put it into some uh, uh, a DNA sequencer, which then spits out some data that you process by information. Okay, so the, uh, um, anyway, we we can now. I, I guess I'll get to that. I think I have a slide of this that I hope. So this so now we can with with this DNA we can make we can get vertical distributions of life and disease just like temperature and salinity. This is from repeated measurements at, at uh, in Monterey Bay. I plotted them against uh, in, uh, oxygen here in all of these panels. And what you see here is that these vertical distributions are very credible. And this, this is published actually in a paper in oceanography, the same one that, has, that I put at the beginning in 2011, 2021, excuse me. So diatoms are abundant at the surface. They're, you can also find them at depth, which is not unexpected. They flux in vertically. Uh, the uh, copepods have this little maximum is, is well, has been well described. They sit right underneath in this layer, kind of hiding in the dark a little bit, um, but in, in very close proximity to their food. Uh, uh, the anchovy uh, follows a similar pattern as, as diatoms. We know it's mostly a surface, although we find their DNA at, 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 at depth. And then McTophets, which we know, or actually this is Hake and McTophets, we know uh, are sitting mostly at depth, but do vertically migrate as well. So anyway, these, these um, and then we're able to take time series. So we had co collected, uh, uh, my, my team had collected samples at this location at C1 and, and, and Put them in liquid nitrogen and save them. They were for different reasons. We collected them. To, we uh, sacrificed them to uh, extract the DNA. The top shows the uh, 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 percentage of the fish, and most of them are either anchovy, sardine, or bony fishes. And you can see this change 
It happened right around the blob when the sardine started to become less abundant and the anchovy started to dominate. And if you take the principal component of the uh, uh, that data set, then you get the, the colored red and blue. And I plotted that, we plotted that against the North Pacific gyre oscillation. And the correlations are, are, are quite high. And if we then take the second mode of the invertebrates and the phytoplankton, they also correlate with uh, the PGO and other things that changed at that time. The reason why the, the principle, second principle component is perhaps the variability, the variability, is because these organisms have a strong seasonal seasonality. So the first mode captures the seasonal cycle, but the second mode captures the interannual variability. There's very little, surprisingly, seasonality in the fish. And it's, that's not, it's not clear if that's because uh, uh, sometimes we're capturing eggs, sometimes we're capturing things that come out. But there is not any clear at all. But maybe something is changing. Because we went to, uh, we went, we went to the, uh, uh, and we had this you know, regime shift where we went to anchovies in the warm period. Uh, but recently, we started, we started to notice that the sardine, perhaps. This is from a cruise. And, and sorry, this is not the best. This is kind of a rough. Uh, these are all the, the fish species that were picked up along this cruise and their colors. And I, I really only want you to focus on, the, on these two colors here. This one's sardine, which sits sitting offshore, where people like Paul Smith thought they mostly were, and the, the anchovies mostly inshore. But we've recently started to see uh, more sardine inshore being caught. So something's changing. Question's always changing. We're still trying to figure out why it's changing and what, what the impacts are. Okay, so this is um, a little bit out of order of where I thought I had it, but I'm now going to talk a little bit more about the uh, nation piece, where we can now, we now have the ability of putting these environmental sample processors on long range AUVs, and they can collect samples for the autonomy. You give them the places where you want them to go. We've been using them in different ways. Recently, we wanted, we've been looking at dial vertical migration. Park them at a, at a meter level or so. Sample as fast as you can. See if you can see that the vertical migration of But they, but they can. You can now collect up to 60s. Well, there actually there's some blanks and things. Let's say 55 samples with a device like this. And you can also actually extract the DNA. We've shown that you can. So I think in the no, not so distant future, we'll be able to uh, uh, go even further because we have these miniature uh, sequences and minions types that, that can be put on, on devices. And we can we miniaturize the computing power so that we can. Uh, perhaps uh, get to a point not in the not long distant future that we can store in real real time. So what about products to, for management? I'm almost over. I'm almost done. Uh, okay, so I'm repeating some of the things I'm, I've said earlier. The observation data for physical variables in good shape. Biochemical variables are Proving, but not yet at the same level as physics. Biological variables are woefully behind. Since biology is typically what we're trying to manage, this creates a problem for effective management. Uh, and most of our effort now is get, placed in getting historical information into a form that is used for generating products. Hence, hence, the information is often outdated. So improving timeliness will improve management 
and, that, and that, I think once we do that, I think the delivery systems are already in place for us to use them. Just a couple of examples here of, of uh, some thought that's been put into how you use information to manage fisheries. This was a report that was done for the state of California. We thought about you know how how these things all link together and how once we have the right information, we can actually use it management. Uh, we talked a lot that you know there's there's a number of different uh, processes in here that there's a regular variability which we know is, you know changes our uh, communities. It, there's the potential, and I think sort, this is sort of happening with the MPGO, who are having an increase in variability. We all expect these rain shifts as, as conditions get warmer, or organisms that can tolerate uh, restricted by cold waters will start to move northward. And, and what's mo mostly worrying us is are there places where we can break away? Things are just going to go. So, in conclusions, uh, observations of physics currently provide important neural information on climate, state, and local observations of biochemical improving the rival those for us in physics soon. Uh, we, we need some autonomous systems in biology. The ecosystem information is not repeating it. it's the same things I said to you a little while ago. And uh, I'll uh, put out a call to if, if you if anybody here has a paper on the California current system and they're interested in publishing it, uh, there is an opportunity. We have a, a, a special issue that is open in deep sea research. This topic uh, here. So I need you to. Uh, One last thing. <laughs> There's no volume here. Okay, this is this is this is a little demo we did we uh, in, in the meeting. Everything that you need to do the eDNA work is here in this table. We wanted to. That, that's how. And we got water samples delivered to us on Monday afternoon. Did the, the work in the hotel room, and. Uh, uh, and presented the results of uh, what we found. Further, getting things from this is from the here. We're getting things from some of the restaurants. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I think that's mostly a joke. But we, we, what one of the things that I didn't mention is that our ability to identify organisms to species is highly dependent on having the available uh, DNA sequence for those species. So with some of the primers we use in that, you can't recognize rockfish past their genotype. Oh, and, and, and then this this is the last uh, the uh, there is an, an effort for, to develop a national DNA strategy. In fact, it's been written. And it's out, uh, it's released by the government agencies wrote it with help from uh, people outside of the government. There's some government agencies here. We said Chris Meyer, both the government and they, they were the ones that wrote this, but they're requesting comments. So this, this eDNA thing, I think is here to stay. All right, so we actually have a functioning sound system in here, which is great. So I will pass this around um, if anyone in the audience has questions for Francisco. And again, for folks on Zoom, uh, please type your questions into the chat if you have them, and we will go over to answer those. Uh, 
With that said, anyone have a question they would like to ask? Hear it. Yeah, thanks, Francisco. So um, I was wondering about the relationship between the NCCO and an event like the blog we had in 2015. So are they the same thing? Or are they, how are they related to each other? And it kind of looked like on one of the images you showed from August, this year that maybe there was another blog in the Gulf of Alaska. So yeah, we can get back fast enough to So if you look at the MPGO, there's your blob. Oh, the, and, and of course, that in negative phase, this would be colder. But that's the characteristic signature, at least for over the course of this record. So when people call it the blob, is it something unique, or is it just uh, a reoccurring phenomenon that's always been there? Well, as I said, this uh, is increasing in frequency. So I, I think they think it's new. Maybe the, the increasing frequency is new. But um, that's why I, th I said also, you know, we, we know what we've observed, <laughs> what we've written. So that, that's why projecting the future is difficult. Because there are things that we don't, we have no idea. Things outside of the, even our universe. <laughs> that are changing. So yeah, I think you have to start with the limit there. Yeah. I think, yeah, is, is this increase in periodicity a function of things that we've done? Or is it? I'd argue. Although we know, of course, that we've changed this in the world. <laughs> so, go ahead. a great talk. I'm really excited about Argus. So that's the sampler, the name of the sampler that you were describing. It's Oh, it was the... Uh, for the eDNA sampling. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's... it's uh, yeah, it, it's, the, it's the environmental sample process. Okay, so yes, it's the... Um, I had a couple questions about it. What volume of water is typically used and just how it's, wide? It's, it's adjustable and it's a liter typically. And so they have a way of, uh, so if you start to uh, uh, filter water and the pressure gets high, it's getting clogged, then you cut it off at whatever. How widespread is it used, like throughout the Pacific? Uh, what time scale? How uh, it's been mainly used in Monterey Bay, they use it in the Great Lakes. Uh, they've gone, they, they had a, a, oh, they, they put it on the sail drone, and uh, uh, you know where the sail drone is? It's a, uh, um, a device that it doesn't profile, it's sitting on the top of the ocean. It's actually made down here. And, but anyway, they put, some, they put it in there, and they've taken it up on Aleutian Island. But I, I don't think there's enough data to make a map of the world for that. Want to bring it up here and do the tactical? <laughs> yeah. All right, done. Francisco, so I'm a little ignorant about eDNA, but it's uh, just extracted from whatever little bit of organic group for drifting around. The question being, do you have any idea what the spatial patchiness of it is? If you went a kilometer away, would you get the same result? It's kind of mixed everywhere. Um, we've look, looked at that, um, in, in the bay in particular. And so they, uh, because we wanted for, for uh, uh, we wanted to know, for example, if our C1 station was representative. 
And so we run another AUV, a different one, that brings water back and then we can filter it. In a diamond in the bay. All of the inshore stations were. Yeah. And, and, then, and then we've done, in addition to having that time series that I showed you, we also have M1 and M2. Really cool data, as you pointed out, you, you only get sort of a, some kind of mass, measurement of mass, like you know, nothing about life that yeah. even yeah. Not relates to But I think, I think that's coming too. There's different ways of looking at that yeah. Uh, yeah. genetically, but yeah. that'll be way after I retire. The real question <laughs> is what, what does it take to start a time series here at Bodega? Yeah. Could we uh, sample intake water or do we, do we have to Well, it's a good question. I think you should, you should take some intake water and look at it. It's not, you know, right. very costly. In fact, if you take it, I can, we can put it into one of our, we, we have this collaboration, by the way, with the Axis group. They do this seasonal uh, surveys, right. and we have a collaboration with Humboldt, part of this marine biodiversity. Yeah, yeah, they, they, right. they uh, I was going to put some of the Humboldt line in there. But, but, uh, um, but so we have eDNA off of your part of the world. Yeah. More regular time series. Yeah. With yeah. The, 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 yeah. The, the, the um, axis is, is seasonal. Yeah. Home. What's that? At the home. They have like, oh. well, I think it starts in, uh, in, uh, I am going through September or something like that. <laughs> uh, so just in terms of DNA, I've heard DNA described kind of like glitter. It's everywhere. It's stuck to So I'm just wondering what the rate of the eDNA in the water column would be, like how accurate it is. So the, uh, st the studies they've done, I think you're asking about how long does it stay around? Yeah, uh, they, they they've done they've done several uh, uh, laboratory studies where they put fish in a tank, and then remove them, and then do a time series of fifteen degrees C. It's about two days. Colder, it's going to be longer. And of course, you you, you don't know. You've got oh it's yeah I mean it's it's not a it's not a simple problem I didn't say it was a simple problem <laughs> I just said it's the only pro way I know of doing things in a way that uh, because you've got the water gets moved around which John was was sort of but I but from whatever we've seen the patterns that we see are consistent with what we think they should be scientists that's kind of how we work right we say oh this makes sense. It was just a, you know, a shotgun attack. Wouldn't be doing it anymore. Did you expect like the biodiversity surveys in colder water less accurate? I can say than if, if you're saying at fifty. Uh, well, it, it depends on what you mean by less accurate. Uh, as I said, also, you know, we, we still debate it over. You know how quantitative this is. I think they'd be different. Polar waters tend to be less diverse. I don't know. That's a good question. I, I I didn't thought of it on a global scale. But what the impact of that? Uh... Uh, well, great talk. Uh, I just had a question about the El Nino. You mentioned that. Uh... In the northern hemisphere and in California, it gets more winter time. I uh, was wondering why that is, and then also if that's something that's subject to change in the future. Well, the, uh, it's because of the, the, the way the cycle generates, which I didn't mention, this El Nino that we have now does not follow the usual path. It started in Peru as opposed to starting in Ecuador. Uh, it, you know, the, the typical way it starts is 
there is some atmospheric disturbance in the Western Pacific generates these waves that propagate uh, from the Galapagos, raising sea level and deepening the thermal climate. Deepening of the thermal climate leads to a warming of the surface. This one didn't follow that. The warming started in Peru, then just stayed there, and then it expanded. So things are changing. The, 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 in the canonical El Nino, that process always comes on. on So we might in the future see warming start at uh, location. Yeah, and, and then California has been, so the, the other thing the MPGO has done is the South, South you know, Peru and California used to be always in sync. If you look at the El Nino picture, the cl classic El Nino picture, warm and warm, cold and cold. But that's, the MPGO has sort of messed with that too. So now we've got the, in conditions where we see cold water in California. Oh, and I don't know if it, I, I don't have all the answers, that's for sure. But things are different. Thank you. Looks like we have one question on Zoom, so I'll ask that. Uh, this is from Sarah Ann Thompson. Um, her question is, uh, also about the impending El Nino, uh, she says that people are suggesting that maybe a super Nino asks if you would care to speculate on how strong you think this event may be in California uh, this coming, uh, which I think we've talked about to some extent how this one might be different than others. But yeah, and I, I had predi uh, my prediction, which I think I'm still holding to, is that it will not become a super El Nino. Period. Because it doesn't have the same dynamic. I would have expected it to become lesser than it has. Since as to what my guess is, I don't expect it to be a deluge in California. Don't call me if I'm wrong, <laughs> or call me if I'm right. <laughs> But yeah, my, I, the years that I've been looking at things, that's what I would think. But again, as we I said before, there's things, you know, statistics are completely different now. Right? Something's changed. In, in Latin America, the people are taking advantage of that by being very alarmist. generating money and doing it. Not quite. <laughs> but it's, it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, everywhere it's going to just rain. And... Peru's very strongly affected by Miami. I think we have time for one more question uh, from the audience. Uh, Eric? So I was interested in the data showing that in California, uh, chlorophyll levels since 1998 have been maintained at high levels, and some of the data sets suggest that they might even be increasing, uh, despite some periods of lower nutrients. So I was wondering if you had speculation on what's driving that. You, you have, is that just from my, the data I showed, or is there yeah, other, other just, reports? No, I'm just going on your yeah. slide. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there either. Uh, and prime productivity is doing the same thing. So I won't show that productivity, which is to be expected if the chlorophyll goes up and activity goes as well. And I didn't, uh, that's not updated. Uh, I looked at an updated one not that long ago. So I'm not sure what's going on. Why would it be, uh, but it's, yeah, it's maybe different dynamics. Have any any speculation on that one? Got me puzzled as well. All right. Well, I think with that, we'll uh, wrap things up. 
Uh, thank you to everyone on Zoom for attending today, and thank you everyone here for coming. Uh, I think that's it. We have another round of applause for Francisco.